wars are not just fought on the battlefield. Civilians suffer in war as well, sometimes even more than the people who are fighting it. But even in the places where bombs never fell, civilians feel the consequences of war. During the First and Second World Wars, countries around the world were compelled to ration goods in the face of the huge demands of massive militaries and the disruption of worldwide trade. In February 1943, the pinch of shortage reached the average American's feet in a way that might have changed the very shoes that you're wearing today. It is history that deserves to be remembered. While the United States faced shortages of some goods during the Great War, unlike the United Kingdom, U.S. consumers were not faced with rationing. The U.S. Food Administration was established for the purpose of stabilizing prices and preventing monopolies. While the Food Administration could enforce rules regarding sales, for example, banning the sale of meat on Tuesdays, consumer participation was voluntary, encouraged via government propaganda. Consumers were asked to conserve and be frugal with items such as wheat, beef, butter, and sugar, but not strictly limited in what they purchased. But as the nation sat on the brink of entry into the Second World War, it was clear that a greater degree of control would be necessary. In January of 1941, President Roosevelt established an Office of Production Management by executive order. The goal of this new agency was to centralize the direction of procurement programs in anticipation of war, to increase production for the national defense through mobilization of material resources in the industrial facilities of the nation. This board, amid demands of supplying Britain via lend lease, quickly took on the character of the types of rationing that U.S. civilians had been asked to respect voluntarily during the previous war. On June 9, 1941, months before the U.S. entry into the war, Time magazine talked about American consumers feeling the pinch. Thus far, the magazine reported, the sacrifices which civilians are going to have to make for national defense have remained comfortably distant and nebulous. Last week, as President Roosevelt once more called for every citizen's loyal cooperation from this moment forward, the sacrifices began to take shape. The magazine notes the potential that motorists might be asked to have gasless Sundays because of shortages due to the diversion of tanker ships to Britain. The OPM also, the magazine writes, announced that defense manufacturers may require all aluminum, even scrap, available in the nation in the month of June. It was clear even then that government restrictions in the coming war might require much more sacrifice than had been asked in 1918. While the Time headline was, Creamless and Gasless Days Face U.S. Citizens, there was an interesting item in another paragraph that might have been predicting the extent of rationing yet to come. Talking about shortages in Berlin, the magazine wrote, On the streets, fraulines left off their stockings and blossomed out in new shoes with the soles of wood, cork or canvas, which have replaced the unobtainable leather. In August 1941, the president established, via executive order, an Office of Price Administration, or OPA, within the Office of Emergency Management. The OPA's main responsibility was to place a ceiling on prices of most goods and to limit consumption by rationing. Four months later, the Japanese attacked Pearl Harbor, and the imperative to ration in order to manage shortages and limit inflation grew. The National World War II Museum explains, World War II put a heavy burden on U.S. supplies of basic materials like food, shoes, metal, paper, and rubber. The Army and Navy were growing, as was the nation's effort to aid its allies overseas. Civilians still needed these materials for consumer goods as well. To meet this surging demand, the federal government took steps to conserve crucial supplies, including establishing a rationing system that impacted virtually every family in the United States. This was a Herculean task. Writing in his 1985 book, For the Duration, The United States Goes to War, historian Lee Kennett explains, As conversion gained momentum and war plants increased their consumption of critical materials, it became increasingly clear that shortages in the civilian sector of the economy would require the introduction of a rationing system. Analysts in the Office of Price Administration monitored the situation closely. No one knew how the public would take to it, but there was concern from the White House on down. The first crisis wasn't actually steel or aluminum, but rubber. The demand from the military for rubber was huge. It took roughly 75 tons, more than 17,000 tires worth of rubber, to build a battleship. While the U.S. was ramping up their industrial capacity to make synthetic rubber and aggressively engaging in campaigns to encourage conservation and salvage of rubber, the supply was not nearly what the U.S. War Production Board anticipated would be needed. Kennett writes that the shortage of rubber loomed closest 
and seemed to require the most radical countermeasure, rationing. First target would be automobile tires, but this would not be an easy sell. The website World War 2.0 notes that many families had to kiss their cars goodbye during the war, or at least their tires. This is something American citizens are not accustomed to, as rubber imports from the Dutch East Indies easily met the high demand for the product before the war. The United States National Park Service writes that three-quarters of rubber in the U.S. was used for car tires. In wartime, however, rubber was needed for military vehicles, boots, gas masks, and raincoats, among other items. Kennedy explained that some of OPA's advisors urged the rationing of tires as early as December 8th, but OPA's director preferred to issue a stopgap freeze order on tire sales, which took effect on December 11th. The delay was necessary because OPA had no field organization. It was to have a dozen regional offices, but only two of them had opened. The OPA developed a system quickly, going through already established local civil defense councils to create rationing boards. The boards were provided instructions and began operating by the end of December, and rationing began on January 5th. The boards would allocate new tires following rules set by the OPA. Kennett writes, their function was to allocate tires based on proof of need, but also on entitlements gauged by OPA's elaborate instructions. For example, trucks used for delivering bees in hives qualified for tires, but trucks that handled beer, jukeboxes, and pinball machines did not. The National Park Service writes that civilians were allowed to keep five tires, four on their passenger vehicle and one spare. The rest had to be surrendered. Good tires were so scarce that the government recommended recording their serial numbers in case they were stolen. Replacement tires were available only through application to the local rationing boards. They issued certificates to those whose vehicles met the qualifications. These included public transportation, transportation of food and fuel, garbage trucks, and for public safety, like ambulances and fire trucks and police cars. Each board, Kennett writes, had a monthly allotment of tires based on the number of vehicle registrations within the county. Sparsely populated Daggett County, Utah, had a monthly allotment of one tire. The system quickly moved to capping sales of automobiles and bicycles and was accompanied by other regulations. For example, rent control that allowed workers to move closer to factories without fear of rising rents. The situation, however, became even more critical as the Japanese overran the Dutch East Indies the world's number one supplier of natural rubber. Economist Paul Wendt writes in the January 1947 edition of the Southern Economic Journal, Japanese capture of the principal rubber-producing areas of the Far East in 1942 eliminated the sources of 90% of the world's natural rubber production. The responsibilities of the OPA had grown, and rubber was not the only issue. On January 30, 1942, Congress passed the Emergency Price Control Act, the act expanded the OPA's authority, establishing it as an independent agency. For the first time, Americans would see rationing books, much like those already familiar in the United Kingdom. The National Park Service writes, Americans received their first ration cards in May 1942. The first card, or ration card number one, became known as the Sugar Book, for one of the commodities Americans could purchase with their ration card. Other ration cards developed as the war progressed. Russian cars included stamps with drawings of airplanes, guns, tanks, aircraft, ears of wheat, and fruit, which were used to purchase rationed items. Gas was rationed beginning in May, a difficulty in automobile loving America. Kennett writes that for the owner of a 12-cylinder Packard and a three-gallon-a-week ration card, the war became the grimmest of realities. Many more things were rationed. Dog food could not be sold in metal cans. Typewriters were rationed, both to conserve metal in production and because of the need for typewriters for the increased clerical work of the enlarged military. Sugar rationing was followed by coffee and then meats, fats, canned fish, cheese, and canned milk. Then, on February 7, 1943, rationing came to the nation's feet. Actually, rationing first came for rubber work boots in November 1942. Author Sarah Sundren writes, To obtain a new pair, a man had to apply to the local ration board, prove that he needed the shoes for essential industry, not for sport, and turn in the old pair. But the new rationing in February applied to all unused shoes, including all types of boots and shoes made in whole or in part of leather, and all rubber-sold shoes. Rubber was already, of course, a critical problem, but leather was also facing a shortage in face of war production needs for things like combat boots and flight jackets. Robert Patterson, United States Undersecretary of War, wrote in a 1945 edition of the Quartermaster Review, Warfare requires a lot of shoes. As the Army grew to its present strength of 8,300,000 men, the requirements for shoe leather grew too. As more men went overseas, living and fighting under the harsh conditions of combat areas, Army requirements rose again. <laughs>
Moreover, Patterson notes, the Army was supplying 100,000 Army-style shoes to the Navy each year, as well as shoes for some Allied troops, a demand that accounted for 5% of the Army's needs. The institution of shoe rationing, however, was handled a little bit differently than the way other rationing had been done previously. Rationing did create certain problems. For example, the National World War II Museum writes the system wasn't perfect. Whenever the OPA announced that an item would soon be rationed, citizens bombarded stores to buy up as many of the restricted items as possible, causing shortages. To prevent this problem, the rationing of leather shoes was announced with very little lead time. The rationing was announced on February 7th and went into effect February 9th. It was, the words of National Enterprise Association News Service Washington correspondent Peter Edson, sprung on the unsuspecting public just like a Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor. The website of research and testing organization Satra explains every man, woman, and child were permitted to buy up to three pairs of leather shoes each year. To simplify production, leather was only made in six colors. Smithsonian Magazine writes that further disappointing the nation's snazzy dressers, the OPA banned boots taller than 10 inches, heels taller than 2 and 5 eighths inches, and fancy tongues, non-functional trimmings, extra stitching, leather bows, etc. The resort set felt the pinch, too. Men's sandals and golf spikes were deemed inessential and discontinued. The initial restriction wasn't anticipated to be a particular hardship. Frank C. Rand of the International Shoe Company told the St. Louis Star and Times, people can get along on three pairs of shoes a year. Although a spokesman for the St. Louis Shoe Manufacturers Association acknowledged that women would be more affected than men, as they tended to buy from four to five pairs a year. You might think that the shoe manufacturers would complain, but industry officials express support. And this wasn't uncommon. Kennett writes that while government officials faced rationing with some trepidation, many merchants were glad to see it come, as they had already wrestled with a whole series of shortages. The rationing would get more painful, however, as leather and rubber production continued to fall behind military demands. In March of 1944, the ration was reduced to two pairs a year. Children's shoes were not excluded, which could be a problem. The National Park Service writes that those with children in their lives know that their feet can grow really quickly, but children were also bound by the ration limit on shoes. Sundin writes that families pooled their stamps, and adults may do with fewer shoes to provide for their children's needs, although she notes that pediatricians and podiatrists complain publicly that shoe rationing would produce a generation of foot cripples. While the rations were strictly enforced, with the OP warning that retailers who sell shoes in violation of the OPA restrictions face prosecution and the imposition of fines of up to $10,000 and a year in jail, the system wasn't without flaws. An editorial in the June 17, 1943 edition of the New York Times argued that the rationing might have actually increased shoe purchasing. Nothing stimulates a demand for product rationing like rationing itself. The tendency of people to buy up to their rationed allotment is almost irresistible. This was particularly true of some shoe rations, which expired on a specific date, driving consumers to stores to avoid losing the ration, causing the time rights, the greatest shoe buy orgy in the history of the nation. There can be no question, the Times writes, that people have bought shoes in the last week who, without rationing, would never have dreamed of buying them for months, or in some case, even years later. And people did break the rules. Sunday notes the case of a California man arrested for stealing seven pairs of shoes from a shipment. He was given a sentence of six months in jail or a $500 fine. But in general, the rationing worked. Sundin writes that to make do with less, people took care of the footwear they already owned, keeping rubber boots clean, dry, and away from excess heat or cold, and repairing shoes and boots whenever possible. Satra writes that some innovative manufacturers produced footwear from materials that were not rationed. They mostly incorporated the plastics of the day, but also included carpet, felt, old brake lining material, and even reclaimed fire department hose pipe. At the end of October 1945, OPA Chairman Chester Bowles called the rationing of shoes one of our most successful programs, saying that throughout the war, though military needs took enormous stocks of leather, no civilian was obliged to go without shoes. By giving everyone a little less, we were able to make sure that shoe supplies would go around. By then, stocks of shoes had rebounded. The New York Times wrote light blue airplane stamps for the purchase of ration footwear were added today to the country's wartime souvenirs as the Office of Price Administration announced the end of shoe rationing, effective at midnight. Shoe buyers might rejoice, but not too much. Edward Atkins of the Popular Price Shoe Retailers Association told the Times a flurry of extra buying might be expected in the next few days, but a buying stampede was unlikely.
Readers of the Port Huron, Michigan Times Herald ask if shoe rationing had been a problem for their family, generally said that it had not. Mrs. Bertha Provost responded that the ending of shoe rationing will not make a difference in our buying shoes. Mrs. George L. Rowe said that we still have some ration stamps. Although Mrs. Marvin L. Kirby said it was difficult to obtain enough shoes for my three children. The Office of Price Administration was officially dissolved in May of 1947, and the effectiveness of the price controls and rationing is still being debated today. The website of the Oregon Secretary of State notes that the OPA was everybody's favorite wartime scapegoat, and black markets flourished. But despite the complexity and the confusion, most Americans admit that rationing was a necessary part of the war effort. The 32 months that shoes were rationed in America seems to have caused less consternation than some other rationing. But interestingly, it changed both the way that we manufacture shoes and what shoes we buy. In 2018, Footwear News noted that manufacturers began to experiment with other non-rationed materials such as plastics and textiles, which are prevalent in shoe production today. Consumers got into the habit of buying practical, versatile shoes that started a trend in casual footwear that continued to grow throughout the nation. Are you a fan of forgotten history? Well, if so, why don't you consider supporting us on our page on Patreon, patreon.com slash thehistoryguy, where even a small monthly donation can go a long way towards helping us to continue to produce episodes about history that deserve to be remembered. Patrons on Patreon get early access to some episodes, some exclusive content, and even possibly a History Guy challenge coin. Join today. I hope you enjoyed watching this episode of The History Guy, and if you did, please feel free to like and subscribe and share The History Guy with your friends. And if you also believe that history deserves to be remembered, then you can support The History Guy as a member on YouTube, a supporter on our community and locals, or as a patron on Patreon. You can also check out our great merchandise shop or book a special message from The History Guy on Cameo. 